Hello, welcome to Establishing and Growing Perennials. My name is Donna Weitzel, a North Fulton Master Gardener, and I will be teaching you everything you need to know to make that happen in your yard. But first, before we get going, um, I want to make sure that you realize you're muted, but you can ask questions by typing into the Q&A box. And at the end of the presentation, I'll answer all the questions, but hopefully I'll tell you all the information you need to know and you won't have any questions. We are recording this. So afterward, you're gonna get a link that will take you to um, a follow-up follow email that will take you to YouTube or Facebook if you'd like to look at it again. And we also have a survey that we would like you to fill out and let us know what you think of the presentation and give us some suggestions to uh, future classes that we'll be uh, teaching. So who are we? Who are the master gardeners? Well, we are in North Fulton uh, County, which is in the Atlanta area. And we are a nonprofit um, under the umbrella of the University of Georgia. And the UGA Cooperative Extension has all the research from the university and all the information that we know to uh, teach you how to be good gardeners. We have free classes on horticultural um, subjects. We also have uh, demonstration gardens in North Fulton County and we um, plant and maintain those. We have children's gardening classes and we provide scholarships for horticultural students. So that's who we are. And now we would like you to learn from us. We have a lecture series. The one this spring has had all these classes that are in gray here on your screen. They've already taken place, but guess what? You can see them on our YouTube channel, North Fulton Master Gardener YouTube channel. Right now, you'll be learning about establishing and growing perennials. But don't forget, next Sunday, you're going to learn about attracting wildlife and detracting critters and a native plant lecture will happen on May, March 23rd. Then at the end, our very last one is April 18th, and that's where you're going to learn about spring vegetable gardens. So we are so thrilled to have you join us. And let's, um, let's talk about our social media for a minute. This is where you will see um, what's going on with the North Fulton Master Gardeners, what classes are offered, what events we are um, in charge of and offering to you. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We also have our own web page, our own YouTube channel, and you can sign up to get emails from us. So if you're ready, I'm ready to teach you how to be a gardener and grow perennials. My name, as I said earlier, is Donna Weitzel, and I've been a master gardener in Georgia for five years, but I've also moved around a lot. So I've gardened in six different states in the United States, and I've been a master gardener in three of those states. Georgia's one, also Florida, also Nebraska. I love to design flower beds and plant bulbs, perennials, and herbs. So I will impart some knowledge to you. And everything that I tell you is going to be about uh, North Fulton County. That's where this um, talk today is uh, centered. But if you are in a different area, I will give you some pointers on how to make it work for you, no matter where you live. What are perennials? Well, perennials are three uh, plants that live for three more or more years. Now, a perennial is not a shrub or a tree. Those are woody stems and 
a perennial is a herbaceous plant. That means it's a green stem and it dies back in the winter. Most of them do. And they reemerge in the spring. So they are still alive in the winter. They're sleeping underground. The roots are growing and healthy. But above ground, it looks like your perennial is dead or not, not existing anymore. Okay, what do we have here? Okay, our agenda today is going to consist of talking about your zone where you live. Very important to know that. The site conditions that you will be uh, seeing in your yard where you're going to put your garden, how to prepare the soil, how to plant, divide, mulch, water, weed, and fertilize that garden, how to deal with pests that you may encounter, and maintain your garden. But stay tuned right to the end, because at the end, I'm going to tell you about some fantastic perennials that you can put in your garden, um, and they'll be easy to grow varieties. So let's get started learning what you need to do. Why do you want to use perennials? Well, if you look at that picture, you'll see there are spiky leaves, gray green leaves, dark green. You have feathery looking plants. And where I'm going with all of this is that within the realm of perennials, of choosing what you're going to put in there, you have different shapes, different sizes, different textures and colors. And also they change throughout the season, spring bloomers, summer bloomers, fall bloomers. So you can have an ever-changing garden from spring all the way to fall. If your perennials get to be a little older and need to be moved, they're easy to move and you can divide them and give some away or plant them in a different part of your yard. I don't want you to um, think that there's no work involved in perennials. Most of the work is done at the beginning before you even put them in the ground when you amend your soil. And also, um, you'll have to do a little bit of maintenance throughout the season, but it's minimal and you will get really good rewards from all the work that you put in in the beginning. Now I live in North Fulton County, as I said, and if you look here, you see zone 7A is this kind of um, lime green here. That's where I live. And I'm gonna bring you in a little closer and you can see Fulton County is this long county in Georgia. And at the very top, that little lollipop up there is where I live. But you may not live in zone 7A. And if you don't, you need to know what your zone is. And you can find that out through your county extension office because everybody has one in their county. I want you to um, know the difference between each zone. It gets colder at the farther north you go, but also the soil is different down here in South Georgia where I used to live, it's sandier. And the temperatures are different it's actually hotter in the summer in some places. So what your zone is, is usually how cold it gets, but it also may um, be a zone that's uh, listed the way it is because of um, the wind or the soil. And it, all of these parts here are the same in many ways in terms of soil and conditions of the air and the cold. Uh, but don't plant varieties that aren't suited to your zone because if you wanna be a successful gardener, you want to give your plants the right conditions. If you have plants that thrive, then you've done the right thing. If you have plants that are struggling, then maybe you put the wrong plant in. Now, your site conditions are where you're going to put your garden. How do you know where to put it? Well, first thing you're going to do is you're going to look at the sun and the duration of the sun in the sky. 
and the time of day that the sun is shining on that place you're going to put your garden. Secondly, you'll look at your soil. What type of soil do you have? Um, how much moisture is in that soil? And is there good drainage? And I will tell you later about all of those things and how to get them just right. There's a slope um, consideration as well. Now, you know, this is simplistic to say this, but water runs downhill. And if it runs toward your plant, it may be giving your plant more water than it really wants. Uh, does the water run away from your plant? In other words, it's just at the top of the hill and that would be a drier condition. So those are some things to think about in figuring out where you're gonna put your garden. Now, when you're thinking about the sun and how much sun your garden gets, start by observing the sun at different times of day. Go outside and look. Does it get morning sun, that beautiful, um, delicate sun that comes up in the morning? Or is it midday with the broiler above, the hot sun beating down? At the end of the day, the sun can be pretty br brutal as well. But if you want to grow sun-loving plants, such as many of the ones I'm going to talk about in this presentation, you really need to have four hours of sun or four to six hours. Um, the Georgia sun is very hot, so you can get away with four and your plants should be fine. But if you want to uh, grow in the garden that has shade or just very little light, make sure that you get plants that thrive in shade. You still need a little bit of sun though because every plant has to have its photosynthesis, which is where the sun hits the leaves, the leaves have chlorophyll, photosynthesis happens to feed the plant. And the sun plays a part in that. How does the sun affect your plant choices? Well, as I said earlier, uh, four to six hours a day is considered part sun in some parts of the country. But here in Georgia, uh, four to six hours can be a full sun plant. Part shade or part sun is less than four hours and a shade plant still needs a little indirect or filtered light so that it can grow properly. Now, some plants are pretty picky about their sun and they just want morning sun, such as peonies, hostas, astilbes, and most ferns. And if you put them in the middle of the day sun from 11 to two, they're gonna not be happy and they just might burn up for you. So where you put the plant, how the sun affects it is very important in your selection of, of site. Now, slope, as we talked about earlier, is an angle of the ground. And I'll talk about slope more specifically in uh, later, but slope also affects the drainage. And if your plant is at the bottom of a hill, most likely it's gonna be more moist there. The other thing about moisture is, Trees, do you have a lot of trees in your yard? Because trees have amazing roots that go out as far as the canopy of the tree. And they will win every time if it's a drought condition because they just take all the moisture out of the ground and they're very good at doing that. So if you have tried to put a garden near a large tree, it may be hard to keep it watered or keep the soil moist because the tree is going to be um, taking the moisture. Also, your soil type. We'll talk about that in a minute, but that is a huge factor in the success of a garden. We'll start with slope. So if you look at this picture, you see there's a very gentle slope and the water will travel downhill, kind of like a little rivulet sometimes. And you want to plant perennials that need drained soil at the top of the hill. And at the bottom, maybe moisture conditions would, would be good for those plants. A sloped perennial border is often very beautiful because at the top of the hill, you have plants uh, that create that high, medium, and low um, effect. And the roots can hold the soil in place to prevent erosion if it's a steep hill. But sometimes hills are too steep 
And so how do you deal with that? Well, you can create drainage by digging a trench all the way down in a beautiful curved pattern and filling it with rocks. And that's called a, a dry riverbed. And it will encourage the water to go down in that um, pattern that you've dug and put rocks instead of washing away your plants. Another thing you can do is to create a terrace. And that is quite a lot of work, but the effect is beautiful. You would have a flat area and go straight down and have another flat area, almost like stair steps. And then those flat areas are where you can plant and you could also have trailing plants that, that hang over the edges. It looks really pretty. If you add stones to your garden, and I, by that I mean large rocks, boulders, they can also um, direct the water, depending on how you put the stones, and they can hold the soil. So now that you've figured out how much sun you have and the slope of your garden, now let's talk about your soil. The soil is very important because with a perennial plant, it's all about the roots. The roots are what are always alive and they are the thing that will keep the plant going for year after year if the roots get what they need. Now, if you look at this, um, <clears throat> this diagram, it starts with air. And you want about 25% of air in your soil. And that's where the drainage is. Um, water drains through, of course, uh, blank spots or air. And the roots can grow through the air as well. There's nothing to push. It's already there. Now, if you want soil that holds water, this uh, would be a moister soil and it's a capacity for the water to stay in there for the roots to, to take up water. So you wanna have about 25% water, 25% air, and then you've got your mineral uh, portion of the soil. And a mineral portion of the soil is not alive. It's, it's a it has chemistry in it that promotes the um, absorption of nutrients for the plants. So it's a good thing to have, but what you might be missing, and we do miss this in Georgia, is organic matter. And you've got to have at least 5% organic matter because you want your soil to be alive. It will have organisms in it. It will have a good fungus and bacteria and insects and earthworms and all the things that provide that soil to be something the plant can use for its benefit and take up all the nutrients that it needs. Here's some soil in North Georgia. This is what it looks like in the summertime when it gets really, really hot and dry. But we do have some advantages to this soil. One of the advantages is that it does retain moisture because it's a clay-based soil. And it also has in organic nutrients that are valuable to the plant. The disadvantages are there has very few organic nutrients. And I'll tell you in later how to get those, but it gets so hard when it's dry that you have to use a pickaxe to get through it sometimes. The poor plants are trying to get their roots down through this hard soil and it can be really devastating for a plant. And there's no or live organisms in there. So this all has to be done by you, the gardener, to make that plant go from struggle to thrive. It depends on how you handle it. What are you gonna do to make your soil a wonderful environment for your plants to grow? Well, you have to imp improve that clay soil. Part of your soil will be organic materials, part will be sand, and part will be existing soil. Now, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna dig way down, eight inches at least, and you want to make sure that this happens to get the soil to bring those perennials back each year. Here's your recipe. 
one third organic material, one third coarse sand, and one third existing soil. Now, what's an organic? Uh, what's organic material? Well, compost, horse manure, or cow manure that has been composted, or mushroom compost. Where do you get these? Um, well, I could do a whole talk on composting, but if you don't have any in your yard, you can go to a garden center and get huge bags of compost. And then you'll dig those in the soil, get the sand, not the kind you put in a sandbox, but builder sand that helps with drainage. And you mix all this together and dig it and spade it and get that beautiful garden area that you have chosen ready before you put any plants in. Once you've gotten all that done, then you want to make sure that your soil is the proper pH. Now, if you took chemistry, you know that pH is the acid or the alkalinity of uh, soil. Seven is neutral, but 6.5 or 6 is about the perfect uh, pH for a garden. In Georgia, this is more where we are. We're usually over here in a very acidic soil. Some plants need more acidic soil, so such as uh, azaleas and rhododendrons and even hydrangeas. They thrive in a little bit more acid soil. But if you need to know what your pH is, there's hope because we can get a soil test bag from your county extension agent. No matter where you live in the United States, there is a county extension office and they can give you a soil bag. You'll take it back to them after you fill it with soil and they will test it for you. Um, and if it's too uh, acidic, in other words, if the number is way down here and you want to bring it up to the 6.5, you're going to add lime. Keep in mind, it takes six months for that lime to really get incorporated. Now, here is a soil sample bag from the University of Georgia. What you're going to do is you're going to go to your extension office. And at this point in time, it's open on Tuesday and Thursday from 10 to 2. So call ahead. You can Google it and find their number and make sure they're going to be there to, to get your soil sample. It's $12 or it's $15 for a test kit. Now there is a website for the test kit. And what you get is um, you get it in the mail and then you send it back to them in the mail and there's no driving or contact with people, but you'll get those results in two weeks. You're going to find out how many nutrients um, you have in your soil, what they are, the pH of your soil, and any recommendations to improve that soil. If you have to raise the pH again, put that lime in, but it's going to take six months to take effect. You probably don't want to hear that right now if you want to get that garden going. But I recommend that you do a soil test because that is going to be the success of your garden. Right soil for the plants. Oh, there's another picture of the soil test. Now let's get started getting ready to plant. You've figured out the sun. You've chosen your site. You figured out where the water is draining and where how how good you're gonna have for draining. You've got your soil amended and now it's time to figure out how to plant. I will tell you all about what to plant later, but right now let's learn how to plant. Here's a picture of a little tiny plant that just came out of its pot. And you've gotten it from the garden center and you put it in the garden. How far apart do you need to put the plants? Well, it should tell you right there on the tag. It needs two feet, mature size, and that's gonna be a lot bigger than what you've just put in the ground. So keep in mind, when you plant your garden and you design those plants, 
make sure you think about the mature size of your plant, not the plant that you're putting in. It's gonna look a little sparse at first. As you, after you put that plant in the ground, there it is in the middle, you ensure that plant, uh, the soil around the plant is tilled up, nice and spaded so that it's fluffy and the roots can just go right through it with no work. You wanna till it until it's all tilled around that plant. When you're putting it in the ground, you wanna dig the hole twice as wide as the root ball or twice as wide as the size that comes out of the pot. And it should be the same depth. So here's how tall this is. So that's how tall, how deep your hole's gonna be. But you're making it twice as wide as this area. Then it will be a plant that is filled in with soil all around it. You'll pack it in, not too tightly, but pack it in so that the soil has been pressed down. And your plant will have room for the roots. The roots will grow right in this area. It'll be happy if you do it that way. When you finish planting, you want to water well. And this is very important that you give the roots a nice moist condition that they can just get started right away. Mulch the new plants, but keep the mulch away from the crown. The crown is where the stems meet the ground. And that's an area you don't want mulch to touch because it can cause diseases and funguses and things like that. So mulch is, we'll talk about mulch in a minute, but it's a very important thing not to just crowd it around your plant. Now, if you look at this plant right here, it's fairly pot bound. And that means that the roots have grown right up um, into the container to where there's no more room for the roots to go. Sometimes they come out the holes uh, at the bottom. The, the pot bound pl plants don't even wanna come out of the container. So you have to cut that container open, ease them out, and then make a couple of cuts in the root ball or and gently spread those roots apart because you want them to grow sideways and down and all around into the hole you've dug. And then you water it thoroughly. Now this dividing is kind of, I'm jumping forward because you planted all your plants and now it's three years later. <laughs> and the thing about a perennial garden is um, it changes from year to year. The first year, your plant will be brand new. It may not even reach its full size. The second year, the plant is really getting those roots established and starting to look beautiful and, and mature. And the third year, it just may start to feel like it's a little bit old and it wants to, wants to move. It wants to be uprooted and divided. So I'll show you what that looks like, but when do you divide? Well, there's all kinds of schools of thought. Basically what I do is if it's a late summer or fall bloomer, such as goldenrod, I'm gonna dig it up and divide it in the spring, the opposite of when it blooms. If it's an early spring and summer bloomer, then I will divide it in the fall. Most people say fall is best to divide because all the plants are up. You can see the leaves, you can see where everything is and you can dig it up, divide it and put it somewhere else in the ground. And then it will have all winter for those roots to take to establish underground. But most people wanna do this in the spring. There's so much excitement and energy involved with your garden and here come the little shoots. And that's when you can also dig it up divide it and get it in the ground before it gets hot. So no matter when you do it, it will help your garden be more vigorous. Now here is a hosta. And this hosta has um, dense roots. So you want to keep as much dirt on there as you can, slice right through it, divide it in half, if there's any dead or woody parts in the center, just get rid of them. 
and then you replant it. And there you go. You have twice as many hostas as you had when you started. Um, if you have these kind of plants here, and this one is a lamb's ear, one of my favorites, Shasta daisies, black-eyed Susans, irises, they all have the same kind of tangled fibrous roots or maybe rhizomes. And it's difficult to keep the dirt on. When you dig that up and start to pull it apart, all the dirt falls off. But that's okay because you're going to plant it right away. You don't want to let it sit there and let it, the roots get hot or dry. And this particular one, I would get probably three or four plants out of it. And you can give them to your neighbors or put them in that little corner where you don't have anything growing. The thing about a perennial garden is you it will expand. You will always get new plants after about three years because you'll dig them up. Now, remember I told you I'd tell you a little bit about mulching. Well, mulching has great benefits. It's going to reduce the evaporation of water and keep your soil moister. It's going to prevent weeds from growing if you get it about an inch or two thick. And it looks pretty. It, it looks consistent and even throughout the garden. And it also keeps the soil cooler. And when the uh, mulch decomposes, it actually goes back into the soil in the form of kind of like a, a compost almost. So it's always good to have a, a really nice a mulch to make your garden look finished. The other thing it does is if you water by hand and the water splashes down on the mulch, it doesn't um, get the soil splashing up. And that's something that, that's beneficial to you as a gardener. What do you use for mulch? Well, you can use shredded bark. You can use pine nuggets or other form of uh, pieces of of bark from trees. Pine straw is very popular here in Georgia. You can even mulch with compost. You wanna put one to two inches and don't get close to the stem of the plants like I told you before. And then ensure that the base of the perennial is still above ground. If you put a whole bunch of mulch and it gets thick and your plant is kind of underground at that point, spread that mulch away so that the plant doesn't get, um, you know, covered up. Now, when you're watering, you may have a sprinkler system. Um, you may need to hand water with a hose, or you may even have a drip irrigation system underground, which is really the best. But whatever you have, make sure that you water one inch of water a week. And that is, unless it's the middle of July and it's 110 degrees in a drought, you don't need to water every day because what you're doing, if you do that watering lightly and just a little bit each day, is you're promoting shallow roots. And you want the water to drip way down into the soil and you want those roots to try to find the water. So they're going down, down, down to find the water. You can use, um, if you water by hand, you want to water at night or before 10 in the morning because you don't want those plants to get fungus on them. So watering is important, but you don't have to water every single day. And you want to water deeply, not frequently. When you have weeds, everybody gets them. You know, one person's weed is another person's wildflower, but you may not want that flower in your garden design. So pull it out with your hand. If you want to prevent weeds, that's probably the best way to get rid of weeds is to prevent them in the beginning. Then um, get a pre-emergent and sprinkle that around in your garden, scritch it in, and it will prevent any annual weeds from um, germinating, but it also makes make sure that you when you're pulling weeds, you're doing it 
um, by hand and not using weed killer because weed killer kills everything and it will kill your flowers as well. Um, something to remember, if you have a garden that's at the bottom of a hill, everything that comes down as the water flows downward from the above area will come down in your garden. So if there's somebody's lawn up there and they're putting a lot of weed killer and nitrogen based fertilizer and all those things up there, it's gonna come down into your yard. So just be careful of that. And it may solve some problems to know that that might happen. Fertilizing. Well, if you compost your uh, garden or if you uh, amend it with organic matter, you don't really need a lot of fertilizer. Those plants that you buy at the garden center, those perennials that are potted, they have so much fertilizer already on them. You probably don't need to put any more. But if you, um, if you do want to put some fertilizer down in this early spring, you want to use a 10-10-10, and that's a balanced fertilizer. Um, put that in, and it will give some nutrients to the plants at the very beginning of the growing season. Too little fertilizer is better than too much, because too much can cause too much grain, and you don't get any flowers. So um, you can also just take compost and what we call um, top dress. And you put about an inch of compost all around where your garden is, and that will serve as fertilizer as well. Pests. All right, we, we don't want to talk about pests, but guess what? They're out there. And see this cute little deer right here eating these uh, daisies? Well, they actually love to eat flowers. Some of them are so delicious to deer. So if you don't want any deer eating your plants, then you should sign up for the upcoming class on how to decritter your yard. That's coming up next Sunday. Um, now, most perennials don't have a lot of pests. And there may be some mildew on the flocks or the bee balm. Uh, hostas are deer salads. They love to eat them. And irises sometimes can get borers. Uh, you can put up a fence to keep the deer out, or you can put traps if you have those little underground voles that tunnel. But most of the time, your perennials will be pretty healthy. And there's a thing called integrated pest management. And this is all about how to deal with bugs that you might get, insects that might feed on some of your flowers. Integrated pest management is a great way to do it because it's not chemical. And we don't really want you to, to spray chemicals and upset the natural balance um, of, of bugs because there are harmful bugs and there are beneficial bugs that eat harmful bugs. So the plants can take care of themselves in many ways. They actually send out signals to bring the beneficial bugs to eat the harmful bugs. So um, you don't have to uh, try to change mother nature. She's figuring things out and you just have to make sure the soil is good and your plants will be healthy and you won't have too many pest problems. Okay, so you've got that gorgeous garden growing and you're so happy and proud of yourself, but you do have a few little things you gotta do during this summer. One of them is to, to pinch back or cut back growth in certain plants. When they start to emerge from the ground and they get up a few inches, you just chop them right back and that will promote branching. Like in a chrysanthemum, you want that gorgeous crown where all the flowers are. Deadheading is where you take the dead flowers off. You just take your finger and your thumb and pinch that flower, that sort of dried up brown flower right off and new flowers will grow. What your plant wants to do is to make seeds. So if you take the deadhead off, 
Don't let the seeds happen. It will promote more flowers. It also makes it more attractive and it stimulates that vigor of the plant. Some plants are tall and leggy and, and they need staking. So you can either stake with a, a straight support, a plastic or wood um, pole, or you can buy these round, um, I forget what you call these, but they are really great because you put them in the ground and the, the plants grow right up through them. And then they never need to be staked because it's already happening. Um, they're rings and you can use them for a variety of, of plants. At the end of the season, your garden is done. It's the end of October, nothing new is growing. So you can take the dead parts of the plant off. You can cut them right back to the ground and you can leave anything that's a green foliage all winter, an evergreen plant. The only thing I'd like to say about that though is some plants are beautiful in the winter. If you leave them with their dead head, such as black-eyed Susans and purple cone flowers, the uh, birds eat the seeds. And it also gives your garden kind of a sleepy, neutral color with a little texture instead of cutting it all back to the ground. But that is up to you as a gardener if you want to do that. Okay. We're getting ready to start thinking about what plants we want. So how do we know? There's a zillion plants out there. What, what do we do to, to make our decision? Well, here's what I do. I think time of bloom, length of bloom. Some plants bloom from June all the way to September. Some plants are only spring bloomers. So you have to know how to line all that up in your garden. The color of bloom and the foliage. Well, that goes without saying. Color is very important. You want things that are going to go together, but the foliage can be just as much of a showstopper as the plant, as the flower. The height, the width of the plant. Also, how do you um, calculate how many plants to put in? You want to use the 357 rule, which I'll tell you in a minute about. And then the texture of the leaves, the flowers, and the plant shape. Those are all really um, important aspects to give your garden interest. The time of bloom and the length of bloom. Okay, spring, still be coral bell, cranes bell, irises bloom in the spring. If you plant those, then they will be done when the summer starts. So now you have to plant some other things that will bloom during throughout the summer, such as coneflower, black-eyed Susan, gallardia, also called blanket flower, daylily, shasta daisy. There's a whole list of summer into fall plants that you kind of get two seasons out of those. But you can have a three season garden by looking up when things bloom. In terms of your color, blue and orange, are famous color combinations because they're complementary colors on the color wheel. Yellow and purple as well are famous side-by-side um, -side colors. But white, don't forget, provides a contrast so that all the colors pop out really um, with more impact if you put white in between. You've got cool colors, blue, purple, pink, that recedes, and you've got warm colors that stand out red, orange, and yellow. And both of those give the garden kind of a different quality, depending on what you want to achieve. The leaves are important as well. You have feathery and fleshy, sword-like leaves, hairy leaves, and they all provide more texture to your garden. The leaf color can play an important role in um, some interest. Gray and green, uh, colors, yellowish green, you can even have evergreen plants, variegated leaves, or some plants are grown just for the leaf color, like hookera. And it comes in a wide variety of colors and you can incorporate that into your plan. The height 
of your garden and the width of your garden and the shape. Of course, three or, three or more feet tall is a tall plant and you should put that toward the back. In front of it, you've got your one to three foot plants and that's most perennials, they're about that tall. And then in the very front, you can have ground cover or short growing plants. The width of plants, well, some plants stay put and they just make a nice rounded shape, mounding um, shape. Others spread and they'll spread underground by roots and they'll crowd into other plants. So you have to know whether the plant you have chosen will stay in its place or spread and then plan accordingly for that. And some plants need a lot of room when they mature to a full size. So don't crowd your plants because you can get diseases from doing that. The shape of your plant, is it an upright grower? Is it mounded? Is it spiky or feathery and airy? All of these things will add uh, interest to your garden. Now, why does your garden look so good? People will say they can't figure it out that it looks better than the one next door. Well, that's because you have the 357 design rule. Now, if you look at this um, diagram here, these brown ones are tall plants, and there's five of them. They're not grouped in a little line like soldiers standing at attention. They're just haphazardly put like this. These blue ones are a little bit shorter. And they are in, there's, if you add them up, let's see, two, two, and four. Now that adds up to eight, but they're separated in groups. So there's three groups of them, one, two, three. So there's your three in that design. Then you have these turquoise ones and there are groups of them, group of them, group of them. And those are a little bit shorter. And then in the front, you know, you have kind of a meandering group of these shorter ones. Do you see anything in a straight line here? Maybe those, but they, they, um, they actually would look more like a pleasing group. So when you're designing, don't design in rows. Don't design like a vegetable garden. You want this to have swaths of color that uh, meander. You're choreographing this to be kind of a dance of color throughout the garden. Repetition is also important. So think of repeating colors. Uh, odd numbers look more pleasing to the eye and groups look better than lines. Remember that when you're putting it together. Look at this picture. Now here's an astilbe next to a hosta. Do you see the difference in those um, leaves? One has large shiny veined leaves and one has feathery darker green leaves. And just those two plants next to each other show how beautiful your garden can be with different <laughs> textures. It's an attractive combination here, even without the flowers. Now, guess what? It's time to choose your plants. I know you've been waiting for this moment and you have a lot to choose from. I'm going to tell you about some, but don't forget, there are many resources out there, catalogs, websites that will give you information about plants. If you look at this picture, you see um, all different kinds of things I've been talking about. Feathery, low growing, tall different colors, different textures. And here are some low maintenance perennials. I'm gonna tell you about each one. The first one is coneflower. Everybody knows this one. It's also known as echinacea. And this particular flower is very easy to grow. It gets about two to four feet tall, full sun, and it even can tolerate drought. But you see these little um, seed heads here? That's what the birds like to eat if you keep it throughout the winter. Black-eyed Susan, that's a way to get yellow in your garden. This one is called Goldstern. That's the variety, this word right here. 
It's very reliable, Black-Eyed Susan. It gets about 30 feet tall, or <laughs> inches tall, sorry. And it will expand. So you can dig this one up and divide it and get two out of it. It goes from the middle of the summer, July, all the way through September. This Shasta Daisy variety is called Becky. And it is a really good bloomer for Georgia. It's full sun, 30 inches tall. So it's going to be that mid range. And it, that white highlights the other colors, as I was saying earlier. It also multiplies. So you're going to dig this up, divide it, give it to your neighbors and friends, or put it in another part of your yard. Black and blue sage. Now, you see that beautiful color? That's really hard to achieve in a garden true blue. But this is um, known as Salvia Garanitica. And you'll hear the name Salvia and Sage used intermittently. Uh, it's the same plant. And it gets this deep blue flower from June all the way to September. Gorgeous plant. It's an upright shrubby form. And it needs full sun. So in Georgia, that's four to six hours. Uh, I put this one in the back, though, because it's, um, it gets three to four feet tall. But guess what? Hummingbirds love it, too. So that's a double uh, good thing about this plant. Stokes Aster is where you can put some pinks and purples and even whites in your yard from June all the way to September. Those frilly flowers add a really nice texture. Um, it's only about two feet tall, so it would be toward the front of your garden, but you do have to deadhead it. Remember when I said you have to take the, the spent blooms that, that are finished? You have to take those off and it will continue to bloom for you all summer and the butterflies will love it. Cat mint, which is also called napita, is a good smelling plant. It has this really aromatic um, leaves, gray green, has that gray green color that's so pleasing to the eye and that mounded shape. You can see this mounded shape. It's about two feet tall and three feet wide. So give it some room. And if you shear it back in June, it will bloom um, in August for you as well. This is a stilby. Some people just love a stilby and it's on the list of deer resistant plants. But my neighbor planted it and the deer just ate it right down. They thought it was delicious. So you never know about deer. It's, <laughs> you have to experiment with what your deer like and won't eat or will. But look at the airy plumes. Isn't that a beautiful plant? It It's early in the summer that it blooms and it doesn't last all summer, but it is worth planting because it's so attractive. It's a showstopper and um, it needs a little bit of shade though. So put this in a place where it only gets morning sun and um, has really rich, well uh, amended soil that's moist. Coreopsis is, this particular one is called um, uh, moonbeam coreopsis. And I love the color of it because it's kind of a whitish yellow, French vanilla color. It's won a lot of awards. It's very reliable uh, Coreopsis, but you can get it in a ton of other varieties. You can even get it in red and orange and pink. And um, you can shear it back in the middle of the summer and it will come back fully. So it's, it's a good plant to tuck in between things. If you have a part of your yard where it's sunny and nothing else will grow there, it's just too hot, too much full sun, you can't even water it because the hose doesn't reach, put this in. This is called Crocosmia. Some people call it Montbredia, but it gets to be about three feet tall. And these orange blooms are gorgeous. Uh, this one is called Lucifer. That's the variety. and it has these strappy sword-like leaves and it will spread. So put it in its own little place and let it just spread out and be happy. Grainsbill is a hardy geranium, not to be confused with the annual bedding plant that you get at the garden center. 
And you can get pink or white or even dark magenta pink blooms on this. Blooms in the spring and the early summer. And look at the leaves. They're so pretty, feathery leaves. And so when it's done blooming, it still looks really nice. It's a mounded shape. It's drought tolerant. And it also attracts butterflies. Goldenrod, it's not the kind that gives you hay fever. That's ragweed. Goldenrod gets bad rap because it blooms at the same time as ragweed. But it, look at the color. Can you imagine your, your garden is starting to get tired? And then here comes this goldenrod. And it's late summer through fall that it blooms. It's two to four feet tall, so it's in the back or even in that area that won't get any water because it, it, is, um, it can take care of itself. Birds and butterflies love it and it doesn't need to be watered as much. And um, it can, you can find some that will be manageable, stay in their place and others will spread. So just look at the fine print when you buy your goldenrod. Verbena, this is a gorgeous plant. Homestead purple is the variety that I love it, because it's mildew resistant and it's an award-winning plant because it just performs so well all summer, from the summer all the way into fall. And then it's evergreen. It stays green all winter. It re looks really good to fill in spaces between, you know, showstopper plants because it's just going to be blooming purple all summer. And um, it looks good in containers also, if you wanna go that route. This is a daylily and it's Hermericalis. Daylilies, I could do a whole talk on daylilies. There's thousands of varieties of them. They come in all colors, all colors, except white and blue. So there's a daylily for every uh, color scheme. Um, there are also tall ones, short ones, ones that bloom early, mid, and late summer. The only thing that's true about all the daylilies is the bloom lasts one day. That's why it's called a daylily. And then it turns it's kind of, we used to call them mush mummies. It just turns to this mush. So you can snap those off. That would be deadheading. Or you can leave them. They'll just keep blooming all summer until it's done. It's good for uh, erosion on a hill. If you want to prevent that, you put a bunch of daylilies and they will just almost look like a ground cover, a tall ground cover. The coral bells, um, earlier I talked about leaf color. Well, these have been um, designed or hybridized to just be gorgeous colors. This one's called Georgia Peach. I happen to put that in our Georgia um, talk here, but they come in silver and dark green. I even have one called obsidian that's black leaves. And they are beautiful, beautiful shaped leaves as well. They have insignificant flowers that grow and tall stems with little bells at the end. Um, but the flowers are, if you cut them, they make good cut flowers in a vase. You want to divide this about every two, three years, and um, it's part sun. You see that? So that's not going to be six hours. It will burn up. You want to put it in a little bit shadier place. Sedum is one that uh, looks like broccoli, and this is what it looks like for a long time. And then at the end of the summer, it turns this gorgeous raspberry pink. It has fleshy green foliage, so you have that uh, difference in texture there. And if you shear it back in the late spring, it will actually get denser and more blooms, just like this. That's really pretty. Um, it likes full sun. And bee balm, which is called Monarda, some people call it Bergamo. It attracts bees, as you would think, and butterflies. And it's a beautiful, um, smelling plant as well. It smells like Earl Grey tea because the leaves can be used for Earl Grey tea as well. Powdery mildew is a problem if you get it too crowded. So you got to have air circulation around this Monarda, but it's, um, it's a mid of the garden, middle of the garden flower. Okay, so 
I've told you about many varieties. I've told you how to amend your soil, how to choose your site, how to keep your uh, garden maintained throughout the growing season, and some choices you might make for different flowers. So I want you to enjoy your perennial garden all spring, all summer, and all fall. So now, if we have any questions, Mary's going to let me know what you need to know. Awesome. Um, so before we get started with the questions, um, please look at the chat box. Um, there is a UGA publication for flowering perennials um, for some additional information that we posted in the chat box. So starting with the questions, Donna. Um, does organic matter include leaves and twigs? Yes, organic matter is anything that used to be alive or is alive. So leaves, um, twigs, bark, all of that chopped up small because you want it, you don't want to have big chunks in your soil, but that is considered organic matter. So you can even take, uh, when you rake your leaves, you can let them um, decompose a little bit. They make a good uh, addition to your soil. Okay. okay. Um, awesome. So do all of the soil prep steps that you reviewed apply to planting native plants? Um, well, we have a native plant uh, class coming up in a uh, week and a half, I think. But yes, native plants need native soil but they also need to have a little amendment to the soil to promote root, root growth. Um, so I'll let Paula Lindsay, who's doing that class, answer that question for you. You can sign up for it. Uh, native plants need just as good growing con conditions as any plant you buy at a garden center. Okay. Um, so here's a qu several questions on soil testing. Um, I live where there are lots of pine trees and limestone. What is the likely soil pH range uh, or amendments needed for happy plants? I would say um, to, to get your soil bag, put some soil in it and send it into the co cooperative extension near you. Mm -hmm. And they will be able to tell you your exact pH and they will be able to tell you what to do to make that conducive growing flowers. Um, so many things can affect soil. For instance, if you're next to a house, you know, bricks can change the pH. Um, if you're in a yard that has certain kinds of trees, they can change the pH. So I wouldn't know how to answer that question. I would just suggest that you do a soil test and that will give you the right answer. Got it. So for soil testing, how many areas around the yard should you test? Um, I think they suggest about eight. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, what you want to do is take um, a little bit of dirt and put it in your bag from various places in the yard where you're going to put your garden. Um, if your garden is huge, you know, you'll probably have more soil samples from different areas, but it isn't just one chunk in the bag. It's different areas and there'll be uh, directions on how to do that. Right. And the directions are pretty specific from what I remember as well. Diagrams and everything. So, yeah, yes. um, good. Um, is fresh wood chips from tree companies okay to use for mulch? As long as the trees didn't have disease. Um, we've done that before where you cut a tree down and then they mulch or they chip it up and you can use that. Uh, okay. what, you, what you want to avoid is if a tree, you know, had pine bark beetles or something in it, you don't want to use damaged mulch. But yeah, that, that would work. You can okay. use that. Okay. Awesome. Uh, what pre-emergent do you use in your flower beds? Um, green and green is one, and that's a fertilizer as well as uh, uh, 
pre-emergent that prevents the germinating of weed seeds. The thing you wanna make sure you don't use is a pre-emergent in a garden where you're gonna put seeds to grow flowers because they will never germinate. So be careful with that. There's other brands out there, um, plenty of them. Okay, I, I should have asked this question first. What is a pre-emergent? I'm very new to gardening. Okay, a pre-emergent is a chemical that when put in the ground, it will prevent seeds from germinating. That means the seed won't grow. And um, you put it in early, early spring because that's when the seeds from an annual weed are, get, are starting to um, you know, they're starting to germinate and grow. So that's what it is. is it, it, you put it down before anything emerges. Okay. Yeah. All right. What is the best type of fertilizer to get big, big blooms? Um, well, we suggest a balanced fertilizer. And that is, you know, the NPK, which stands for the three chemicals of fertilizer, the same amount of each of those chemicals is in a balanced fertilizer. Um, I wouldn't suggest uh, anything more than that because you don't wanna mess around with the soil and put different chemicals in for different results because each flower kind of has its own uh, needs. Okay. Um, and I would imagine the next question is, um, is there best fertilizer to use on crepe myrtles? I would imagine it's probably pretty close to the same. Um, crepe myrtles. Well, a crepe myrtle is a tree, so I'm not that well versed in that. But um, any balanced fertilizer is the best thing for your soil. And a crepe myrtle... Uh, you could look it up. What does a crepe myrtle need in terms of um, pH? I think they're a little acid loving. And uh, you do it in the spring when it just starts to get the root growth. And But the best fertilizer for a crepe myrtle, any balanced fertilizer is good. Gotcha. Yeah. Is a bag of mixed flowers good to use for a pollinator garden? A bag, um, I, I assume what you're talking about is one of those um, mixed seeds. Yeah, like, like, the, like the wildflower bags that you can get at Lowe's in the garden center. Um, the thing that you have to be careful is that some of these bags of seeds are not conducive to growing in our area. Um, it has to be wildflower seeds that are, you know, good for growing in zone 7a of um, North Fulton or wherever you happen to be. So <clears throat> make sure that whatever is in that in that seed um, mixture can grow here. And I've done that actually. I've just put wildflower seeds out and it's pretty successful. Mm -hmm. But then the next year the perennials are going to come back and the annuals won't. So you, it'll change each year. Right. Um, question on where do you personally go to get your flowers from? I go everywhere. I mean, there, I go to, you know, passing a garden center, put the brakes on and go in and see what they have. Um, I've used websites uh, for, you know, garden centers that send them to you in the mail. I've gone to the big box stores, although some of them have uh, chemicals that they put on the plants. So I don't like those, but I would just say whatever's close by, go there and see what they have. Make it as easy as you can for yourself. And then when you get well-versed in growing all these plants and you start getting catalogs and you start uh, looking at websites, you're going to know what you want. You may have to drive a little bit to get that particular plant, but just walk around and look at everything. That's the best way to know what to get, I think. Right. Okay. What is the best way to get an invasive variegated vine that spreads through my garden? I, I don't want it to kill others, but it's, it's obviously a, a pest in their garden. 
And and do you know what the vine is? Did they say? It, it doesn't say. Well, it sounds like it might be ivy. You got to pull that out. Pull it out. It's almost impossible to get rid of ivy. Um, it's an invasive plant in Georgia, and we don't recommend even growing it. Mm-hmm. But um, you don't want to put a bunch of poison on it either. So pull it out, and that's what I recommend doing. Okay. It's not easy. So the plants that you are going through at, at the end, are any of those um, native to, the, to Georgia? Oh, gosh, now you're making me remember what I said. <laughs> I think, um, yes, there is one that's native to Georgia. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because what I want to say is you can incorporate native plants within a perennial border. And there are some beautiful native plants that would go with all the ones I talked about. Um, The ones that I said are easy to grow here, but they may not be native. And I'm thinking goldenrod is, I think. Anyway. Sorry, I didn't have a better answer for you. <laughs> okay, and I'm sure that all that Google will have the answer to all of that. Um, how do I improve moisture retention on a slope with a lot of leaf litter? Moisture retention on a slope with a lot of leaf litter. Well, the leaf litter should help keep the moist soil. Mm-hmm. Um, you could also plant something as a ground cover kind of, of soil, uh, like daylilies. Put mm-hmm. those on. They don't need water. They can hold the soil in place. That would be my recommendation: is to find something that you can just fill in with that plant, and okay. it will hold everything in, in place, and including the soil. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for gardens for those living in the Northeast? In the Northeast, yeah, <laughs> like New England, or I mean, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so that's not really Northeast, but kind of. Um, I would assume Pennsylvania and further Northeast. And, no, and New York, I live yeah. there too. Um, well, that's a beautiful place to grow plants. And you can get fantastic perennial gardens up there because there's a nice long, cold winter so that those roots get their, you know, growth period and, and there's a dormant period for the for the plant. But go to your county extension. They will have probably a publication for you on things that grow in your area successfully and um, go to your garden center and look at see, see a good garden center will have things that grow in, in your area. Um, but yeah, you can have a gorgeous garden up there in the northeast. <laughs> And, and the plants may be different than the ones I talked about, but some of them are the same. Okay. Um, there is a request for the, the name of the pre-emergent that you said that you use again. Uh, green and green. Okay. That, that was it. That was it. Okay. E-R-E-N, green. <laughs> what are the bulbous growths on my bearded and day lilies and what should I do with them? Bearded lilies, uh, bearded irises, maybe. I'm not sure what. Yeah, a pr- probably, lily is. probably so. Probably so. Bearded irises. Um, well, you might have um, those borers I talked about. So just look that up. Google iris borers. I think you have to cut that area right out of the plant. And what was the other one? Uh, daylilies? Daylilies, uh-huh. Um, I, I'm not familiar with, with that, but if you have a plant that looks suspect, pull it out of the ground because you don't want to spread to the other ones. Okay, yep. And you can even take it into your local garden center and say, what is this? You can also go to your extension and say, what is this? And they I, will give you an answer. Right. Um, and in this area, Pikes is a great 
place to do to do that. Yeah. Um, there are more questions, but we're getting close to the end, so um, we won't ask any more. But we will be going through all of the questions and getting them answered, and then we'll post them on the website um, for people to look at later. Okay. Okay. Well. Um, remember to sign up for um, Attracting Wildlife and Detracting Critters on the 21st of March at 2 p.m. That's just next week. And then we have our Native uh, Native Schmative, which is about native plants, and some of you are interested in that, so be sure and tune in. And finally, our spring planting demonstration for vegetables is going to take place in, in uh, April. So thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure to tell you about perennials and happy gardening to you. Thank you so much and we'll see you later at the next class.